So as our audience uh, continues to assemble, I'd like to share just a few brief words about the James Wilson Institute and our co-sponsors. Uh, the mission of the James Wilson Institute is to restore to a new generation of lawyers, judges, and citizens the understanding of the American founders about the first principles of our law and the moral ground of our own rights. Our deeper purpose, of course, is to restore to students of all ages the furnishings of mind of those uncommon men who establish and preserve the regime, such as the subject of our webinar today, James Wilson, with the hope that a new generation will be able to preserve it once again. Next, the Center for Religion, Culture, and Democracy at First Liberty supports the creation and promotion of high quality scholarship at the intersection of religion, culture, and democracy. Its publications, programming, and resources affirm the importance of religion as a public good for strengthening social bonds and reinforcing foundational freedoms. And we at JWI are thrilled to be partnering for our 10th annual James Wilson Fellowship for Young Lawyers this summer with the CRCD. Our next co-sponsor is the Kivitas Institute. Kivitas, located at the University of Texas, is a community of scholars committed to exploring the ideas and institutions that sustain a free society and enable individuals to flourish. It values independent thought, civil discourse, free speech, reason, deliberation, and intellectual curiosity. Its programs facilitate inquiry into the foundational principles of a free and enduring society, individual rights, civic virtue, constitutionalism, and the rule of law. The executive director of Kivitas is Justin Dyer, one of our longtime affiliated scholars at JWI. Finally, the Jack Miller Center is dedicated to reinvigorating American education through its founding principles and history, an education vital to thoughtful and engaged citizenship. It does so by building and sustaining a community of scholars in the fields of American political thought and history, restoring the teaching of American citizenship, and by partnering with organizations and philanthropists to advance civic education that is grounded in America's founding principles and history. Thank you to all of our co-sponsors and the audience they've helped us they've, uh, bring together today. Allow me now to introduce briefly our panelists in the order in which they'll present. First, Professor Hadley Arcus will frame today's webinar on James Wilson. He is the founder and director of the James Wilson Institute. For 50 years, he taught in the political science department at Amherst College, where he was the Edward N. Ney Professor of American Institutions and Jurisprudence. In 2016, he assumed emeritus status. He is the author of eight books, including the forthcoming Mere Natural Law from Regnery Publishing, due for release this May. Wilson has always played a significant role in Professor Arcus's scholarship, in particular on constitutional interpretation. Next, we'll hear from John McHale. He is the Carroll Professor of Jurisprudence at Georgetown University Law Center, where he's taught since 2004. He teaches and writes on a variety of topics, including constitutional law, moral psychology, moral and legal theory, cognitive science, legal history, criminal law, torts, international law, and human rights. He's the author of Elements of Moral Cognition, Rawls's Linguistic Analogy and the Cognitive Science of Moral and Legal Judgment from Cambridge Press, and over 50 articles, chapters, essays, and reviews in peer-edited journals, law reviews, and anthologies. He has written extensively on Wilson from the perspective of, of a constitutional historian as well as as a constitutional theorist. And I would be remiss if I did not note that he was a former student of Professor Arcus's at Amherst College. Finally, we'll hear from Jonathan Gnapp. He is an associate professor in the history department at Stanford University. He is a scholar of revolutionary and early Republican America, specializing in the period's constitutionalism, political culture, legal history, and intellectual history. He is also interested in the method and practice of the history of ideas. His first book, The Second Creation, Fixing the American Constitution in the Founding Era from Harvard Press, rethinks the conventional story of American constitutional creation by exploring how and why founding era Americans' understanding of their constitution transformed in the earliest years of the document's existence. It won the 2017 Thomas J. Wilson Memorial Prize from Harvard University Press and the 2019 Best Book in American Political Thought Award from the American Political Science Association. He has written extensively on the relationship between history and constitutional originalism. He is currently at work on a large book on the forgotten history of the preamble of the US Constitution, currently entitled, We the People of the United States, The Struggle Over Popular Sovereignty and Nationhood. And as Professor Gnapp will tell you, the preamble's construction of We the People, well, that came from James Wilson. With that, I would like to thank our presenters in advance for the time and preparation that went into this webinar. Now, I'd like to th turn things over to Professor Arcus. Okay, 
Thanks, Garen. We owe to your genius the forming of this program today. We have two fine young writers and professors, I can't say enough about them, who they've given us two remarkable books. And since I actually have, I think I should hawk one. Here's John, John McHale's book on the elements of moral cognition. I flag it because Cambridge is a fine press for printing books, not so good for selling them. And uh, this is an extended commentary on John Rawls. And I think if the world were rightly constituted, we'd have Rawls writing on the works of Mikhail rather than Mikhail writing on the works of Rawls. Um, we also have Jonathan Gnapp, who had this remarkable book also, The Second Creation. And I gathered by the title, Jonathan was reminding us that this is the second constitution, that the union of the regime is older than the constitution. There were principles that were there before the constitution and be, they'd be there even after the constitution, if there were no constitution. And the founders didn't think it either practicable or necessary to set down in the text everything they happened to know about the principles of law. Both John and Jonathan have found a way to the redoubtable James Wilson, who, of course, we venerate. We named our own institute after him. And I think they sought to bring back the work of Wilson, in part because he was, in fact, one of the premier minds of the American founding, who hasn't had anywhere near the recognition or the celebration he deserves. But also because an understanding of Wilson and his teaching was just open to us open us to a fuller and richer understanding of this constitution that he had a major hand in shape. Well, I have to say a special word about, about John, who's my student analyst. Years ago at Chicago, Leo Strauss alerted us that we may have in our classes a student with powers of intellect and soul that may exceed your own. And John is the leading nominee for that slot. John had with me at Amherst uh, the course that turned into the book First Things where I cite Wilson in the opening pages of the preface before we can get to, into the book. And his lines, Wilson's lines, would sort of thread through my work just as the lines of Thomas Reed would thread through the works of, of Wilson. And I'd like to take just a moment to put in place uh, some notable points of Wilson that would help frame the problem of this regime he was trying to shape. In that very first case listed in the US reports, Chisholm versus George in 1793, Wilson said, we're at the beginning of the law. We have no distinct precedents to cite under the Constitution. So we have to be drawn back to the general principles of jurisprudence. But before that, we have to be drawn back to the principles of mind and how we know. So he was drawn back to Thomas Reed with this excellent inquiry into the human mind with those principles of common sense. Speaking of those that skeptical and the liberal philosophy which under all the false pretensions to liberality prevailed in many parts of Europe before he wrote. In other words, the constitution would ascend to the task of judgment only after we insisted in the first instance that it was indeed possible to judge. The court would reject skepticism or moral relativism in all of its forms as the very ground of entry into our law. Natural rights, in one of his most telling lines, that both, both, both Jonathan John appreciate Wilson insisted that we didn't bring forth this constitution for the sake of inventing new rights. We brought forth rather to secure and enlarge those rights we already had by nature. Blackstone has said that when we enter civil society, we give up those unrestricted rights we have in the state of nature, including the liberty to do mischief. And we exchange them for a more constricted set of rights under civil society, called them civil rights, rendered more secure though, by the advent of the government that was in a position now to enforce, to which Wilson said, when did we ever have a liberty to do mischief? Or as Lincoln would later put it, when did we ever have a, a right to do wrong? Those laws that restrained us from raping and murdering do not restrain us from anything we have rightful liberty to do. So when the question was raised, what rights do we give up when we enter under the constitution? The answer tended by the Federalists and Wilson was none. Hamilton said of the Federal State 84, here the people surrender nothing. It was the purpose of this project to give up our natural rights. So then the question was, what sense did it make to attach this codicil called the Bill of Rights, listing those rights we hadn't given up? Unless we're now implying that, in fact, we have given up the corpus of our rights in entering onto this uh, Constitution. But then who was the bearer of those rights? 
Wilson said in Chilson that the law in England would begin with an understanding of the sovereign issuing commands. But here in this country, the sovereign, when traced to its source, would be found in the man, the natural person tendering his consent to the terms on which he's governed. As the understanding ran, no man is by nature the rule of other men, in which men are by nature the rule. God is by nature the rule of men, and men are the nature the rules of dogs and horses. He was and said supreme power would be justified only in the sense of him who is supreme, but for those creatures somewhere between angels and animals is governed by consent. Or to put it another way, those creatures with the capacity to give and understand reasons deserve to be ruled with a rendering of reasons in a regime in which people in office were compelled to keep justifying themselves the people trying to say, seeking to elect them. But if those beings, in fact, were the bearers of rights, now, when do those rights begin? As Dan Robinson, you say, when do we get those rights and do we weigh more when we have them? When do those rights begin? And the answer from Wilson was, if these are natural rights, they begin as soon as we begin to be. So he says, the, so the common law casts its protection over human life from its first stirrings in the womb as soon as it is known that we are here. And the critical part of this understanding is that just as our natural rights were not created by the government, neither were the bearer of those rights. And this touches on that exquisite part of Wilson's teaching, where he exposed that crippling contradiction in John Locke, the critical difference between John Locke of the inquiry into the human mind and John Locke with a treatise on government, um, with the inquiry block and the inquiry in your mind, we do not really perceive things that are external, but only these certain images and pictures are printed on the mind, which are called impressions and ideas. So with lock of the inquiry, we know at most nominal essences, not real essences. We know all the things only through the senses, through the impressions they make on our hearing or touch. This device is a pen. It could be used as a weapon. Just it, what it is, what its meaning is, what depend on the conventions that arise among us telling us how it is used. And in the same way, the way we see human beings may be affected by the conventions, but what the law comes to tell us is a human being as we've seen in the arguments over abortion. But the point is, instead of knowing a person, instead of knowing a person in this view, we have an idea or impression of a person. And so Wilson asked, Wilson asked, when you look at me, you see an impression of me because of the mental image, the images are, are inverted. Do you see an image of me or do you see really me? So with this novel understanding though, wielded by philosophers, Wilson said, we discover that there may be treason without a traitor, laws without a legislator, punishment without a sufferer. If in these cases the ideas are the traitor, the legislator, the sufferer, then the author of this discovery ought to inform us whether ideas can converse together, whether they can possess rights or be under obligations, whether they can make promises or enter into covenants. In other words, can ideas bear responsibilities? And if they can bear responsibilities, can they bear rights? So rights and responsibilities attach coherently only to real essences, real persons, those beings, as Aristotle said, who are distinctively fitted by nature for the polis and the life marked by law. And so Wilson gave us a kind of moral realism as the ground of the Constitution and its telos, its, its purpose. And so here we are now in a robust politics careening within that frame that Wilson marked for us, but often with little awareness that there is such a frame and a moral structure. Now, I think John and Jonathan can lead us into a luminous way past the kind of confusions about the Constitution that have been absorbed now in our conventions and the confusions that arise in our politics precisely when the writers seem clueless about that structure. So I want to give this over to, to John and Jonathan, opening up to either one of these questions we've, we've talked about. What might Wilson help us to see in the Constitution that could be screened from it? by the theories or conventions that are spawned us among us, or alternatively, to put both, both John and Johnson, 
what is that led you to find your way to Wilson? And once you you found him, what made you not want to let go of what you'd found? So, well, over with John, is that right? John? Great, thank you very much, Hadley. And uh, let me start by saying what a pleasure it is for me to participate in this event uh, with you and with Jonathan. I wanna thank Garrett for all of the work he did to bring us together. And I'm grateful that both he and you uh, mentioned that I was your student at Amherst College um, quite a long time ago, over 30 years ago now, uh, because I'm quite confident that the first time I ever heard the name James Wilson was in your classes, um, mm -hmm. which I took um, back in the late 1980s. Um, I do remember reading the first pages of First Things and uh, encountering this man, James Wilson, and sort of scratching my head and uh, wanting to know more. So I credit you with <laughs> lighting the spark um, uh, of my own interest in Wilson. And um, it's been a very um, rewarding experience to, to continue to study him over the years from different vantage points. Um, I'll make just a few opening remarks and then you know, turn things over to Jonathan and hopefully we can have a nice back and forth. Um, I want to pick up on a question you just asked, which is, uh, you know, what what really motivated me to get to know more about Wilson? And and quite honestly, um, one of the factors was the one you touched upon, which was Wilson's uh, theories of natural jurisprudence, of natural law, his understandings of um, of ethics and epistemology and the human mind and how we come to have moral ideas in the first place. Um, and this is really uh, one of many things that sets Wilson apart. Um, the, the founders as a group were quite um, intelligent and well-read and uh, uh, very um, you know, reflective and thoughtful on many topics, but not too many of them dived as deeply into philosophy, into moral philosophy and epistemology as Wilson did. Right. I think he really stands out in that regard. And you can see this in his law lectures where he's writing very knowledgeably about Descartes and about Locke, and about Hume, and about Reed. Um, and so that was one of the first um, sources of interest for me. You, you, you kindly and uh, uh, generously mentioned my book, and I should say you were far too generous in your description of me, but I'll, I'll set that aside. But um, in any event, um, my work originated not so much in constitutional law and constitutional history, but in moral philosophy and moral psychology. Right. And Wilson is one of the few people who serves as a bridge for me, actually, from my interests in moral philosophy and moral psychology to constitutional law, because, again, he was one of the few um, figures on the scene in late, late 18th century America who was writing on both topics. And he is a rich source of ideas um, on, the, on the connections between uh, moral philosophy and, uh, and law. He says at one point in his lectures... <clears throat> that the moral sense is a distinct and original power of the human mind. And our knowledge of topics like natural jurisprudence and the law of nations flow from that source. And I think in a very deep uh, sense, he's correct about that um, and, and trying to come to grips uh, with just what he meant by that and, and what a credible <clears throat> intellectual framework um, approaching those topics today would be. Um, in the 21st century, knowing what we do today about the human mind and about uh, where moral ideas come from is, is really quite challenging. And he's a continuous source of, um, of ideas and inspirations, at least for me. I want to pivot, having said all that, to constitutional law, since that's our topic <clears throat> today, and just make a few opening remarks about Wilson and why he is so important. Uh, he's the man who wrote We the People. For starters, that's the title of a, the tentative title of a book that I'm working on on Wilson. Um, the tentative title is "The Man Who Wrote We the People: James Wilson and the Creation of the United States." And I think there are no uh, more important words, uh, three more important words than "We the People" in the um, in the understanding of Americans about their constitution. It's a phrase that is endlessly fascinating and engaging and controversial because we want to ask questions like, well, who is we the people? Who are we the people? Who are the members of the political community uh, to which that phrase refers and did refer um, in the 18th century? And of course, we're all quite familiar with the modes of exclusion 
and oppression and uh, racism and sexism and so forth that kept various groups of people out of We the People. Wilson was ahead of his time, I think, to a significant extent um, in having a capacious understanding of who We the People were and are. Um, and there's a lot to talk about uh, just on that point alone. The phrase we the people was not just a, a toss off phrase for Wilson, because of course he believed deeply in the concept of popular sovereignty. And I think Jonathan's written quite um, wonderfully about this uh, and others have as well. Perhaps alone among the founders, he saw what the notion of popular sovereignty could do to reconcile what the framers were doing with the Constitution and breaking from the Articles of Confederation and putting the government of the United States on a new sounder footing that was not derived from the authority of the states, but from the authority of the people. And as you said in your remarks, Wilson under understood sovereignty as residing ultimately in the individual. Um, he, he draws upon uh, Burla Maquis and other writers on that point and it does um, connect with how he handled actual cases like Chisholm um, in trying to understand what claims of sovereignty in, in the context of an adjudication like Chisholm against Georgia uh, amount to and whether and where sovereignty lies in, uh, in the Constitution. So that's one whole set of topics that is really quite important um, uh, with respect to Wilson, but it goes well beyond just the preamble he was one of the two chief draftsmen of the Constitution, along with Governor Morris. Wilson uh, was a member of the five-member committee of detail that did most of the actual uh, construction of the Constitution in its first phase um, in late July and early August of 1787. And he, as far as the evidence um, suggests, was the leading uh, uh, draftsman of the committee. Uh, Edmund Randolph had produced a kind of an outline of the Constitution, which James Wilson then took and turned into the Constitution's first complete draft. And in writing that draft, he crafted many of the clauses and phrases that have become so important in American law. The vesting clauses, for example, at the beginning of Articles 1, 2, and 3. Uh, the necessary and proper clause, which I've written quite extensively about, which is a critical clause in the Constitution for understanding the separation of powers. Um, the take care clause, which goes to the heart of presidential uh, authority. And Wilson, drawing upon a proposal and a resolution that had been um, adopted uh, uh, by the convention, um, drafted the first draft of the supremacy clause in the context of this committee of detailed draft. He did something very critical in that. Uh, in, in, in drafting that clause, which is he subordinated state constitutions to federal law, which had not yet been on the table. So he was constantly thinking of ways to enlarge federal authority. He was a nationalist and um, really one of the strongest champions of implied national powers at the convention and in the years uh, thereafter. Um, Wilson also plays a critical role during the campaign to ratify the Constitution. So I could say more about the drafting of the Constitution. He, he is really, his fingerprints are all over the Constitution, including um, with respect to some issues that we look at today with regret, like the great compromises over slavery. We should note that Wilson had a large hand in crafting some of those compromises. When it came time to ratify the Constitution, he was arguably the leading Federalist spokesman, at least in the early phases both in his state house yard speech uh, and then in the Pennsylvania ratifying convention, he went first in many instances in laying out what became the standard Federalist arguments about the constitution that were later picked up and elaborated in other state ratifying conventions. Pennsylvania was the first large state to ratify the constitution. It was critically important. Um, and Wilson played uh, an extraordinary role in that convention um, and in, in shaping the Federalist um, uh, defense of the Constitution. Gordon Wood and others have written about this, and I think it's really uh, important. There are passages in the Federalist papers written by Hamilton, Madison, and Jay, for example, that um, come straight from Wilson. In fact, I think that debt has not yet 
fully been chronicled. Um, uh, some of it amounts to almost straight plagiarism. Um, and Wilson then, of course, after the Constitution is adopted, <clears throat> goes on to the Supreme Court. He's one of George Washington's first uh, appointments to the Supreme Court. So he's a member of the first Supreme Court. And as Mava Marcus, who is really the leading expert on the early years of the Supreme Court, has pointed out, Wilson was quite diligent and devoted um, and took his job on the court quite seriously. He was hardworking. Um, he rode circuit and in doing so, crisscrossed uh, the United States, perhaps more than any other justice. So it's interesting to actually track where Wilson goes in the 1790s. And he's north and south. And in the middle part of the country, he's really traveling all over the country. He is issuing important jury instructions that lay out, uh, in some cases, his theory of the Constitution. And then, of course, there are his law lectures in the 1790s, which fortuitously come down to us through the efforts of Bird Wilson, his son, because it's quite possible we might never have seen the law lectures, given how Wilson's life ended. Um, in 1804, Bird, uh, Wilson, Wilson's son, publishes um, from the notebooks that, that he um, had of, of Wilson's lectures, um, an edition, the first edition of the law lectures. And they're a rich store of jurisprudential ideas that, again, ha have not fully been tapped. So many interesting um, things in the lectures from, uh, from the standpoint of intellectual history. I have um, laid out quite a quite a bit, and I rather than going on, I, I think maybe I'll stop there. I have I was asked at some point maybe to say something about Wilson's contributions to Article Two of the Constitution in particular, and his role in shaping the American presidency. Because again, arguably, he was the chief architect of the presidency. He comes into the convention with very distinctive ideas about what the national executive should look like. And in many cases, his views prevail. Um, Bill Ewald, uh, an expert on Wilson who teaches at the University of, uh, of Pennsylvania and is a friend of, of Jonathan's and mine, has written um, very perceptively about this, calling attention to just all of the um, elements of presidential power and the structure of the office that Wilson championed right from the start. So maybe that's a topic that we can return to and we can talk about Wilson's view of the presidency and separation of powers and of course, judicial power because he was a strong champion of judicial review. He was maybe the most democratic uh, member of the Philadelphia Convention. So he, he was strongly in favor of extending the franchise, franchise as far as possible. So on issue after issue, he takes quite uh, unusual and deeply interesting positions that um, cut across many of the usual categories that we tend to use when we think about the founders and try to pigeonhole them in, in different ways. But let me stop there and I'll turn things over to Jonathan and look forward to further discussion. Okay. Thank you. Well, I'll echo the thanks that John offered to both Hadley and Garrett for extending this invitation, which is so wonderful to have an opportunity to chat with all of you about um, James Wilson. So, um, you know, Hadley mentioned my book, The Second Creation, and one of the ways I came to James Wilson, um, I'd long been interested in him based on my interest in founding era intellectual history, was in, as I began to try to make sense of how people understood the constitution when it first appeared and the kinds of ways they conceived of it, I found few people who spoke to this more perceptively than Wilson, not just his own substantive views, but his recognition that there were key questions to be answered. And this came especially during the ratification debates. John laid out his, his life's work with the Constitution so brilliantly there. Um, and it comes up a bit at the Constitutional Convention, but especially during ratification, when people are considering whether to approve the work of the Philadelphia Convention, to try to gain a toehold, lots of people in the ratification debates, and this begins in Pennsylvania and the Pennsylvania Ratifying Convention are trying to analogize the Constitution to other kinds of things that are more familiar, other instruments of law. And Wilson has this really perceptive comment in which he effectively says, stop trying to compare the Constitution to those other sorts of things. 
a treaty or a statute or what have you. Recognize what it really essentially is. It's a, it's a people's charter. It's a popular charter. And understand what that means. And then this leads him to engage in this long disquisition on popular sovereignty, um, which was something that always interested me. How, what a deep student he was of that concept, which had been around in protean form for some time, but was just being worked out in greater detail at this time. So I came to Wilson, um, I, I, you know, I was pulled in by the fact that he seemed very aware of the deeper dimensions of the constitution. And that's um, a big reason why I've continued with him because what I wanna just say to sort of set up these preliminary remarks is like a lot of people at the time, James Wilson strongly believed that the United States constitution like any constitution was embedded. To understand what the constitution was, to understand what it did, what it required, what it allowed, what it protected was to understand its underlying foundations. Um, and two conceptual contexts or foundations were especially critical to him that I think he's sort of a master tour guide for in understanding the founding. So the first concerns the nature of law itself. Um, and like a great many people at the founding, and this connects to things Hadley said in his opening remarks, James Wilson had a very different view of law than tends to prevail today. Often the conception of law was that like the principles of mathematics, law was something that was out there. It was something that you found rather than something you simply made. Um, and this was especially true of fundamental law. Um, it was not simply the contingent constructions of human beings. It was not simply positivist in character. Um, it was something that had a different set of sources that could serve as crucial foundations for legal reasoning. Natural law being one of the most striking examples of these sources of law, but there were many. Um, but even more than that, what I think Wilson um, helps us understand is not just that there were deeper legal foundations or that law was to a great extent out there and found as much as made, but also the way in which he understood law itself. Like a lot of people at the time, he had a very integrated view of law. He didn't like drawing categorical distinctions between sources of law, natural law over here, customary law over there, enacted law over here. Um, he didn't tend to separate what we might call positive law from what we might call non-positive law. What he instead thought was that law by its nature, the different sources and kinds of law one could identify naturally harmonized. And the study of law was the study of that harmony, how it's synthesized. And John mentioned his law lectures, which are arguably the best legal treatise we have from the founding era, uh, but it's one of many. And one of the most striking things about them is they bear no relationship uh, to a legal treatise that would be written today. They seem to draw freely without any sense that they're leaving the bounds of law on all sorts of other intellectual subjects that we would instead refer to as political theory or moral philosophy or sociology or psychology or history. Part of how John, a cognitive philosopher, made his way to Wilson. There were not sharp intellectual breaks here. There were not disciplinary breaks. Um, to understand law was to understand human nature, was to understand people and the human mind. It was to understand this, this grand synthesis of human beings themselves and to understand how it all held together. So Wilson, like a lot of jurists at the time, like a lot of people who thought about this, really tried to understand how natural law, positive law, common law in both its non-positivist and positivist forms and British constitutionalism, how they all harmonized into a general account of general legal principles from which one could reason and interpret a particular constitution of government that included not just the US constitution, but also the Articles of Confederation that preceded it and the various state constitutions. Um, we, we can, Wilson allows us to not just see different kinds of law, but especially a different conception of law itself and how you reason about it. Um, and I think it's very hard to understand what happens in the founding era without recognizing that key way in which people thought the constitution was embedded. The second one I'll just briefly speak to was social compact theory or social contract theory. 
the ubiquitous idea that the formation of any government involved two steps. I mean, it was, it was hypothetical, it was imaginary, but it was, it was very much how people at the time made sense of this process. Step one, you leave the state of nature and form a political community or a polity or a people, if you will. And then step two, that people sets up a constitution of government. And this was so important because this underlying foundation of the social compact, which was beneath the constitution of government, was considered an essential feature of the constitution and an essential ingredient for making sense of that constitution. You couldn't really understand what the constitution of government was, what it required, what it allowed, what it was supposed to do, what it fully permitted, unless you understood that underlying compact, unless you had an intelligent, well-grounded account of it. And in the context of the United States, this was immensely important because the United States, just empirically, if you stared at it in 1787, presented a, a complex federal union that had come out of the British Empire. There are states, there's a union, the people calling themselves Virginians and Americans. What is this thing? Uh, and there were a lot of intense fights over exactly what the United States Constitution was. But these really mattered because Wilson and so many others recognized that unless you could understand what the United States was, you would have a difficult time fully understanding what the United States Constitution was. You had to understand who or what had authorized and set up this constitution of government. And John mentioned, we the people, the first three words. Well, let's add um, the next four words of the United States to James Wilson and others who thought like him. This was enormously important. It was not just rhetorical flourish. We the people of the United States offered in his mind extraordinary proof of what he thought the Declaration of Independence had wrought, which was not 13 free and independent states acting autonomously, but one people. Um, and in that regard, we can see how James Wilson is thinking of the United States Constitution as very much embedded in a vision of the social compact of the United States that calls directly back for the Declaration of Independence. All right. Okay. Actually, can I pick up on um, a couple of strands, both of your both of your presentations? We the people. Remember, Daniel Webster made much of that in his argument against nullification, but the notion that the states were part of the compact. And he said, no, um, the states are not part of a compact. In fact, the, the American people did not stand in relation to their government as a contracting party. We said, we the people do ordain and we are ordering this in the name of our sovereignty as a people. Um, okay, so we're, we're ordering that we're not simply making a contract with like us. We, the people stand in relation to the government as a principle in relation to its agent. Now, there are a couple of things, just playing off that as a nation. And John John made an interesting argument about, uh, important argument that, uh, of corporate powers, that because it was a nation, it was seen as a body corporate. As it would remain the same, even as, as inhabitants die and the population changes, it would have the powers of making war, but also making contracts. And that brings us back to those opening moments. And I'm wondering, do you, do you have the ground now for saying that Wilson had it right that first moment? Because remember, the question was raised, uh, on what ground? Remember, it was a question of whether a state could be brought into a suit by an individual, could be sued by its individual. And the court said, it, yes, it could. And, if, and the political, the political uh, class reacted by passing a constitutional amendment, giving us the 11th Amendment. And for 100 years, the court kept twisting itself around, trying to make sense of that, that amendment. But remember, Wilson's argument was, the question was, uh, if... Uh, what's the ground on which the state, a state, could be obliged to respect its commitments, be held accountable? And the answer was, at the same ground, an individual may be held accountable. And he'd say, well, a person may sue um, the city of Philadelphia, but Phil city of Philadelphia being the corporate body of, of 40,000 people, persons who make up Philadelphia. So then you raise the question, I guess, actually, it was actually John Jay, who put the question then? If a person can sue the 40,000 
who make up the city of Philadelphia, why can't the same person sell the 50,000 who make up the state of Delaware? Would you got looking back and think that Wilson got it right, perfectly right that day? And, and the political class made a powerful mistake? Oh, definitely. Wilson uh, was someone who thought in the framework of corporate law, or the law of corporations, right. right? as that was understood in the 18th century, Blackstone and other writers had written about the law of corporations. Um, and a corporation, we have to recall, at that time might include things, and even today, like a church, or a city, or a, a, a guild, or a trading company, or the nation state itself. Um, Wilson, uh, during the campaign to ratify the Constitution, says this entire instrument is simply an act of incorporation. What we are doing here is incorporating a government. And he and many of the founders periodically referred to the United States of America as uh, a legal corporation. So that, that phrase, the United States of America, was the style or name of the corporation that we know of as the government of the United States or, or um, the government created by the Constitution. And many important uh, things flow from this. So uh, even, even before the Articles of Confederation were adopted, the United States was acting as a juridical person in many respects. And Wilson and many of the other best lawyers in the founding generation understood this perfectly well. That is to say, it was entering into contracts. It was borrowing money. Um, it was actually in the Congress declared what would be treason against the United States. So there were elements of nationhood and elements of corporate personhood that were um, emerging right from the beginning. By the time we get to 1787, these are well established. And so um, it was understood at the time that uh, when a group of people incorporate or create a corporation through an act of incorporation, the corporation has certain powers that don't have to be expressly enumerated. For example, the power to fulfill the purposes for which the corporation was formed. Right. And the powers that Blackstone outlined in the commentaries, the power to own property and to sue or be sued, as you just alluded, um, right. or uh, the power to uh, make contracts or to operate under a common seal and so forth. And all of these, I think, are powers of the government of the United States that someone like Wilson simply took for granted. What happened in the history of American constitutional law is that a certain kind of ideology emerged for a variety of reasons um, quite early in our history. And it is the ideology of what our friend David Schwartz has called enumerationism. Right. Uh, and that is the theory that all of the powers of the government of the United States are enumerated in the constitution and the government can only act if it is exercising one of its enumerated powers. And the corporation perspective or the, or the perspective of the constitution that comes from the vantage point of corporate law should make us realize fairly quickly that that is a mistake. It is not true that the United States is a government of only enumerated powers because there are implied corporate powers, for example, that um, Wilson and other founders presumed the government would exercise uh, uh, right away and in fact had already exercise before the, um, before the adoption of the Constitution. And a similar point goes to the concept of nationhood. So it's not just that the United States is a corporation, but the United States is a nation. And that's why the remaining opening words of the preamble that Jonathan called our attention to are so critically important. It is we, the people of the United States. And there was great meaning in that for Wilson. Um, that's why he somewhat surprisingly says in Chisholm, is this just like kind of an ordinary contract dispute between uh, the state of Georgia and, and, and uh, uh, someone who the state of Georgia was stiffing on their contract. He had sold goods to Georgia and Georgia was now not paying. So that looks like, in some respects, an ordinary contract dispute. And yet here we see Wilson, in his opinion, saying, this case turns on whether we are a nation, which is a really kind of striking thing to say in, in, such, a, in such a lawsuit. But for Wilson, all of these things tied together. Um, because the sources of authority in the Constitution that bound Georgia uh, did flow from the conceptions of popular sovereignty and the social contract and the 
nation that the United States um, had become and the government of that nation that the Constitution had uh, created and incorporated. So it's all, I think, interrelated in, in rich ways for Wilson. Um, and I do think, uh, I, I do think you're right. So just to go back to the question you asked, yeah, I think Wilson was correct to think that there's no conceptual jurisprudential difference between lawsuits against the state or uh, another, a natural person, an artificial person. And that might extend even all the way to the United States itself. So Wilson and Jay flirt with this notion too. Maybe the United States government uh, does not have the same kind of sovereign immunity that Georgia claims. The justices kind of beg off that question. They don't frankly want to say that in Chisholm, but you can see the logic of their argument is pointing in that direction. And um, and it, it is for fairly deep seated reasons. I hope you'll write on that, John. About years ago, I tried. I tried my hand at writing it. I think we have about three or four votes for that position, uh, upholding Wilson. And it, it, I, I do a verse of Holmes. Holmes said, "The life, let's see, experience is worth a pound of logic." And I think what Wilson tells us is that an ounce of logic will save, save us generations of misspent experience uh, on these things. I remember going to a reenactment of, of, of Chisholm several years ago with Nino Scalia playing the court and uh, Seth Waxman playing the role of Edmund Randolph. And at the end of it, uh, Nino says, well, the court didn't have anything interesting to say that day. And so they're not with a famous. Let me pick up again, another point you said about implied powers. I remember Marshall in, um, I think it was the uh, Dartmouth College case says, but raise the question, perhaps if a state uh, dissolved the contracts of marriage. Could that present an interesting problem under the contracts clause? Well, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. We don't have to deal with it. But he sort of lifts up the curtain. And years later, we'd find it, in case of family custody, even liberal judges like Alex Holtzoff in Washington would keep a, in, a, in, a, in a racially mixed marriage would award the children to the white parent on the assumption that the black parents would be not be as well, there'd be more advantages. And it took the court to say, no, we've just established a, a fundamental principle about the wrongness of racial discrimination. Don't you see that it applies here? In other words, the court, by discovering that that implication had simply now altered, but put in a totally different cast, the, the family law which we always understood to be quite so, uh, anchored in, in the States. Listen, I'm open to this with Jonathan, um, jo Jonathan coming in uh, at any moment, but let me put another question. Um, Alexander Hamilton in the Federalist 33 said that the, the Necessary and Proper Clause and the, the Supremacy Clause were simply implicit in the logic of the Constitution. It would be there even if never mentioned in the text. Necessary proper clause simply rose out of the logic of moral agent, a being who understands he doesn't have a right to do wrong. He can claim only the powers necessary to a legitimate end. And sovereign, the, the supremacy clause was, well, it marks the difference between a, the articles of a confederation and a real government, where a real government would have the authority overriding the, the subordinate units. So I guess my question is, why, why do we need it? Is it because you assume that most people didn't have the wit of Hamilton to figure this out on their own? Or what, what, was it, were, the, were those, those, those clauses really necessary? Should I jump in here, John? I feel this was this is John's life work in, in some ways, so we'll see I, how well I can. And you, yeah, jump, yeah. you jump in at any time. I just, sure. Oh, I think one way to set this up, and then I'll hand it off to him, because I think it ties back to some of the things John was just talking about that I think are so important that are about this question about what is expressed, what is implied? How are people thinking generally about constitutionalism? Some of the most interesting things about James Wilson, you discover by going back to the beginning of the revolutionary period, well before the US constitution was written. So John mentioned an implicit understanding on the part of Wilson and many others that the United States is a juridical figure that can do all sorts of things. I mean, this becomes one of the central things that Abraham Lincoln points to on the eve of the Civil War about the things the United States was doing, prosecuting the war 
entering into contracts, negotiating treaties that the other that the states were not doing from an early time. We have this extended period, which is enormously rich and often not that deeply studied. Prior to, well, the, during the initial drafting of, but certainly prior to the ratification of the Articles of Confederation, constitutional debate without what we would regard a constitution, because there isn't one in place to interpret and debate. But that does not stop the members of the Continental Congress from having extraordinary debates about what the powers of the United States government is. And just, you know, to, to make, pull on one concrete example, my favorite debate that I'm, I'm, I'm writing about at great length in, in the book on the preamble that you mentioned, comes in February of 1777. And it's where things are changing in the Continental Congress, because initially there's the John Dickinson draft, which seems to imply that there's going to be a broader scope of authority for the federal government. And now some other characters have shown up in Congress, nobody more important than Thomas Burke from North Carolina, who is sort of a fierce defender of local sovereignty and states' rights and is responsible for what becomes Article II of the Articles of Confederation, the, the clause that says that anything is not expressly granted is um, reserved to the states. Prior to that, though, prior to that debate over Article II, um, the first debate, really, that Thomas Burke has with James Wilson and these competing ideas of what even are we as the United States is over this question of policy pertaining to prisoners of war. It's a very central problem for the Continental Army. Um, sorry, not prisoners of war, deserters. How do you deal with military desertion? Um, and the easiest way to do this would be to empower people who worked for the Continental Army to apprehend supposed deserters without having to coordinate these efforts with the state governments. So basically circumventing state authority and saying, we just have the authority, no matter what state we're in, of apprehending deserters. Thomas Burke says, this is horrifying. How could you circumvent the state authorities? Those are sort of the basic due process procedures that will that that is necessary to conduct the question that you're overseeing, which is you're trying to figure out whether this person actually is a deserter or not. And Wilson says, your, your distinction is confusing. Your, your, your point of entry here is confusing to me because as we have been doing from the beginning, the central question here is you take any problem of governance and you ask whether it's of a continental nature or not. If it's of a continental nature, if it has these sort of broader implications that expand beyond the scope of a state's welfare, it obviously automatically falls to the jurisdiction of the United States government, just as all those other things we've been doing since September of 1774 did before we even issued the Declaration of Independence. And Burke says, I don't necessarily disagree with that point. I'm just very concerned about the various state constitutions we have and the various rights that are protected there and what it might mean if state governments are not involved. But we're seeing here James Wilson making it very clear. So that, you know, this tease up John to Federalist 33 in the Supremacy Clause, <laughs> that if you're gonna understand the Necessary and Proper Clause, clearly that is built on a foundation that Wilson himself had been operating on for many years about what is already implicit in answering the question of what is or is not of continental concern. And that's a distinction he never abandons. Um, and I think is is very important. So I can hand it off to there. John is sort of, that's the 1770s and 80s. I want to say, John, I, I should be jumping in and here. You, you, you feel free to just jump, jump in at any time. You don't have to linger with that question I roast about uh, the Federal yeah. 73, but just, just come on in. Come on in well, again. Well, let, well, Jonathan set that up so wonderfully that let okay. me just kind of build on what he said, because I agree entirely with what he said. And I would take it, you know, even a bit further. Um, along lines that, that both of us have written about. So another way to put what Jonathan uh, said is that for Wilson, even before 1787, the power that became or that was proposed as Resolution 6 of the Virginia Plan, which was the power of the United States to legislate and to regulate in all areas uh, to which the states were not competent and which were of continental concern, was already the operative theoretical principle uh, in the period uh, under the Articles of Confederation. And even for Wilson, I think, from the point of the Declaration of Independence onward. So he understood um, constitutionalism in just that way, 
even before the Constitution uh, uh, of 1787 uh, is written. And so the proposal in the Virginia plan was not something new, but was actually Wilson's theory of American constitutionalism or his theory of federalism, if you like, um, that, that was already present. We should be clear about what happens to that theory. And it really is best explained perhaps by going back to this figure that Jonathan mentioned, Thomas Burke, who is a representative from North Carolina to the Continental Congress. And the two interests that really were motivating Burke the most, I believe, were the controversy over Western lands and slavery. And you can actually see this in the fairly thin records we have of what was discussed in the Continental Congress at the time. So for example, in the course of making these arguments and in the, uh, the effort that Burke made to insert Article II into the Articles of Confederation, the Reserved Powers Clause, Burke invokes, invokes Somerset versus Stewart, the famous case that Lord uh, Mansfield decided yeah, right, in right. England um, about the status of slavery under the common law. And so it's really right there near the surface a recognition on Burke's part and also others in the room that an implication of the Mansfield decision in Somerset was threatening to slavery um, and an aggrandizement of power by the federal government or the nascent government of the United States might threaten domestic slavery, I think in the eyes of someone like Burke. And then the other issue was Western lands because Wilson was part of a contingent in Congress that was continuously trying to argue for jurisdiction over Western lands, resting in the Congress rather than resting with the states. And the, this was kind of a sectional divide. It tended to be delegates like Wilson from Pennsylvania, from states like Maryland, Delaware, and New Jersey. And the large landed states, especially in the South, North Carolina and Virginia were very uh, antagonistic to this idea. So I, I mentioned these two, um, these two interests because we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that politics and uh, interests played a very big role in how all of this unfolded. We could talk about this some more later on, but my own view, and I think maybe it's a view that Jonathan shares, is that the Wilsonian view on the scope of implied national powers ultimately um, does not prevail in the early years of the uh, of the United States, in part because of interests like these. Um, the, the, the sort of the rise of the Jeffersonian Democratic Republican Party is in large measure organized around the repudiation of the view of government power um, that, that someone like Wilson held. And so you see this in the, the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions in the emergence of the compact theory in um, a demise in the kind of robust nationalism that Wilson and others, Morris, both Morris's and, and even George Washington himself tended to espouse. Um, but that's a much longer story that I don't you know, want to launch into, launch into now. But I John, why do, why it's do, all very uh, uh, related to the things that Jonathan was saying. John, why do you think they, they feared that the national authority would be anti-slavery rather than being acquiescent? Why would it have been? Yeah, why do you think a national, unless it's just, it's just an authority not under the local control? Is there any, any reason to think well, that national authority at the time would have been anti-slavery? Not necessarily. I mean, and by the time we get to the 19th century, national authority is pro-slavery in, in almost every respect. Um, so there's a declension there, I think, to some extent. And I wouldn't want to overstate how much anti-slavery sentiment there was in 1787 or in 1790, but there was substantial anti-slavery sentiment. Um, sure. It's hard to say. But in point of fact, the early abolition petitions that go into the first Congress, um, signed by people like Benjamin Franklin and, and advocated by um, uh, 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 Thomas Mifflin and others, the sort of the Quaker abolitionists, and also people like Absalom Jones, the African-American um, uh, clergyman in Philadelphia, who on behalf of African-Americans is petitioning the government to abolish slavery repeatedly throughout the 1790s. When you look at the arguments, the constitutional arguments that those petitioners are making, they are what I would call Wilsonian um, in the following sense. They invoke the broad 
robust implied national powers that are encapsulated in the constitution by clauses like the preamble and the sweeping clause or the necessary and proper clause. Mm -hmm. um, the clauses that, that people like Wilson and Governor Morris were uh, most responsible for putting into the constitution. That might not have ever been likely to succeed those efforts because there was too much pro-slavery sentiment. And you know, it's, it's a big and an interesting historical question about the sort of what if what if there had been a, a um, more political mobilization around those issues? What if someone like George Washington had thrown his weight, for example, behind efforts to adopt a gradual abolition statute, for example, which might have been the most realistic possibility? I think Wilson would have supported something like that. In fact, he says as much in the Pennsylvania Ratifying Convention. He says, we've laid the foundation for abolishing slavery out of this country. Um, and that's really quite remarkable. He he also, um, you know, he had he had floated the idea of a general emancipation as early as 1776 in the Continental Congress, and there was a fierce negative reaction to that on the part of South Carolina delegates and others. So, the slavery issue is obviously present all along. Um, it's hard to piece together, you know, the exact positions and viewpoints that different people held and what you know might have happened if there had been a different political configuration. But I do think it's important to bring that perspective in as we think about yeah. this. If, if I could just quickly sure. speak to that, um, agree with everything John said. I think what we see in these early years is a lot of possibilities and uncertainties. So you're quite right, Hadley, that it doesn't need to cash out in the way it does, that the national government would be partial to slavery or against it. I mean, the ratification debates basically break down. The Federalists say the Constitution is good because it's anti-slavery. Uh, the Northern Federalists say it's good because it's anti-slavery. The Northern Anti-Federalists say it's bad because it's pro-slavery. It's exactly flipped in the South. The Southern Federalists say it's good because it's pro-slavery. The Southern Anti-Federalists say it's good because it's anti-slavery. So that in and of itself suggests that coming out of 1788, there's a lot different people can do with this thing. Okay, so then you're kind of casting about. And if you want to protect slavery, you've just, say, gone through the South Carolina Ratifying Convention. You have reasons for wanting the Constitution, but you're very anxious about this. One of the places you might look is, well, this new thing, the federal judiciary, which is going to be constructed from scratch. We know that people who are behind the project of creating the judiciary have been complaining throughout the 1780s that there hasn't been a national judiciary with sort of muscular authority to enforce the interests of the United States, usually in the form of um, enforcing the Treaty of Paris. But once you start in, you know, one, once that judiciary has some muscle on it, what might it look like? You know, we, we, we can't just assume that it will turn out the way that, that we know it to turn out. So who's going to be on that judiciary? Well, the first people appointed, James Wilson, John Jay, people who have expressed hostility to slavery, William Cushing, who is chief justice in Massachusetts has just authored the decision in the Quack Walker case, resolving it uh, that basically uh, by judicial fiat declares right. that slavery is inconsistent with the constitution of Massachusetts. Wow. If yeah. there, if, if we don't know, this is something that John has, has, has brought my attention to over many years now, if it is not yet known whether there will be a federal common law of crimes. So what exactly will the jurisdiction and scope of authority be for federal judges? Just because we have a sense of how the judiciary develops. People standing in 1789, 1790, trying to game this out, there's things to be potentially concerned about. Um, and why is William, what William Cushing did in Massachusetts not gonna replay itself at the federal level? And John, just as a closing point, John mentions this fabulous debate so rich over the anti-slavery petition sent to Congress that set off a firestorm in, in February of 1790. One of the most amazing things said in those debates by Thomas Scott from Pennsylvania. So somebody uh, you know, connected to Wilson in terms of his home state politically says, maybe what these petitions are saying about what Congress can do with slavery is a bit too much. But I might go take them to federal court and go find a federal judge and see what he says about uh -huh. these authorities. Uh -huh. And this is, again, in the shadow of what William Cushing has done in the Quack Walker decision in Massachusetts. So how people are thinking um, capaciously about these things, slavery is very much on their minds and very tethered to this idea of what national power 
might be able to do. And what we know becomes the case by 1830 is not necessarily what they know in 1790. Right. Well, remember, uh, Alexander Stevens complained in the Carson speech that those founders of the South were as bad as the founders of the North. They too are under superstition. All men are created equal. And Justice Curtis cited in uh, Jack Scott that opinion in Lydia versus Rankin, I think it was in, in Kentucky, by a local judge saying, of course, we know that slavery is incompatible with the natural law. It could be sustained only by positive law, by people making an accommodation. And so the statute, uh, uh, the position on fugitive slave court, I wonder if Bill Wilson might have written that one. It was cast in terms of the positive law. Persons held to service under the laws of the different states. Now, Harry Jaffa once argued that the court in Dred Scott could have declared the um, uh, the congressional statute uh, uh, unconstitutional. Do, do you think that was a possibility? You, you would think that's a possibility? You would think they claim those powers? I, I think you certainly claim it. People not think it implausible, but I think it yeah. is. Yeah. No, I think I think you're drawing attention to something very important, Hadley, which is the role that slavery played in pulling apart some of that synthetic view of law that you've written about and consider so essential to understanding what's going on in Chisholm and what's going on generally at the founding, how do you get to a view from positive law synthesizes with all these other sources of law in so many ways to it really has to be treated, at least in some respects, as quite different? <laughs> One of the easiest ways to tell that story in the history of the United States from 1775 to 1840 is to just look at state judicial opinions over slavery. And other people have written on this. Wow. 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 All right. Right. Because the easiest way to avoid the obvious contradiction of how slavery is an affront to really anything else you might appeal to, but might have legal authority, is to draw a wedge between um, the enacted positive law of the legislature or the Constitution and all those other sources of law that you as a judge have been using pretty freely in other cases. Um, and I think you, you know, so there's a story there about, about the mischief it causes. Um, and, and then on the other side of it, what seems legally impossible, you know, whether, whether Jaffa was right or not, that's an interesting question, but I think many possibilities were on the table initially that that process of remaking the law to accommodate slavery make far less plausible. If I could um, jump, on, add, add, jump in here on this point, I, I, I agree entirely with what Jonathan said, and I think it's really so important. So uh, one has to think about what a judiciary comprised of justices like Cushing, Jay, and Wilson looked like to Southern slaveholders. It was quite unsettling. Um, uh, the first Supreme Court, of course, consisted of six justices, evenly divided three Southerners and three Northerners. And I suspect that was not a coincidence. It was part of a signaling um, that there was not going to be a particular threat to slavery from, from the court, um, but it could have gone in a different direction. And then the point that Jonathan made um, about the federal common law of crimes is really mm. critical here. Viewers of this show, um, this, this webinar that we're holding here, are probably familiar with Wilson's Law Lectures. And one of the most striking features of the law lectures is that so much of them concern criminal law in a way that would be right. odd right. Uh, for a Supreme Court justice today to, to write about, right? Um, Wilson spends a, a large um, uh, uh, per, per, per proportion of the lectures discussing um, basically the common law of crime. Um, and 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 his understanding of of, of uh, criminal law in the sense of uh, use, not lex, sort of criminal law as part of jurisprudence broadly, but it's also a reflection of the fact that criminal jurisdiction was part of federal jurisdiction in the way he understood federal jurisdiction, and the way that most of the federalist judges in the early period did, and this was bound to cause great consternation uh, among slaveholders, and it did. And that's why you see the Jeffersonians, for example, targeting the concept of the federal common law of crime so insistently um, and ultimately killing it. Because if you think a moment about whether the institution of slavery could exist alongside 
a federal common law of crimes, if that law was expounded by anti-slavery judges, well, that there's going to be a big set of conflicts there. It's quite um, it's quite likely to happen. And so another way to make this more concrete, we should remember Henfield's case, which is a case in which James Wilson adjudicates the prosecution of a man named Gideon Henfield, who is prosecuted not under a statute, but under bodies of unwritten law, like the Law of Nations or yeah. Washington's proclamation and so forth. And if it's true, as Wilson said in that case, that when 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 he was challenged, said, well, what law have I violated? And Wilson said, you have violated the law. You violated the law of nations. <laughs> well, if slavery is antithetical to the law of nations, then you could imagine cases in which that might have been brought into an adjudication, those kinds of ideas. And that was completely unsettling to the elite status quo at the time. And so there's a tremendous pressure to essentially move toward a kind of legal positivism and away from the sort of natural law that Wilson and other uh, jurists of his uh, of, of his way of thinking were very comfortable with. So I, I, these are very complicated topics that interweave in various ways, and we're just skating along the surface here in many respects. But I do think that they are all related. And understanding just how that is so gives us um, insight into Wilson. Um, and, and, and his particular position in this early federal federal judiciary in, in light of the things that he believed. So you think of, what's it, John Marshall, is it the Antelope case saying that international law is it is national before it is, it is international with, with law, that, that slavery may, may be incompatible with the, with the natural law, but the international law may have to depend on the uh, dominant opinions in the separate units. Um, but now before we break for questions, I think it'd be useful to draw both of you out on the matter of the executive powers that, that uh, you've been concerned about, John. You think of, during the Articles of Confederation, there was a, we had a committee of foreign affairs. I think John Jay was the head of it. And I think he was running agents, spies. And whatever you call that function of running agents and spies, it can't be done in daylight. Uh, this is something that must stand as, as a distinctly executive function. Now, uh, if you go back to it, think, well, what would Wilson sense be of, of executive function? Here we have, remember, the great beloved Jean Rostow saying that here you had Hamilton and Madison arguing about the reach, about the powers of Congress under foreign affairs. And if anybody should understand what the original understanding was, it should be these two, who <laughs> there their president of creation. So this is a serious uh, uh, question. So now what, what would Wilson, how would Wilson help us in thinking through this matter of the executive power? Well, I'll just speak briefly to this and I'm interested in what Jonathan thinks. Uh, I mean, yeah. Wilson was one of the chief architects, if not the chief architect of the presidency. He believed in the idea of an independent presidency. So the president should be independent of Congress and of the judiciary and vested with executive authority. I mean, it is a fact that things that Wilson says at the convention and his conception of the presidency do plant the seeds for what today many commentators think of as the unitary executive. He thinks that executive power should be concentrated in a single individual um, and, uh, and that that should be um, an office that's independent um, and whose authority traces to the people. So really our modern conception of the president as you know, someone whose authority comes from the entire nation is very much Wilsonian. On the foreign affairs side, I think Wilson believed in, in robust foreign affairs powers, many of which were implied and unstated. Um, someone you've written about, uh, Hadley, George Sutherland, right. has right. ideas that really, I think, are quite close to things that Wilson probably believed. So right. Right. Um, both in the Curtis Wright case, but also in um, a book that Sutherland writes before he becomes a justice about the Constitution and world affairs. Right. Right. He right. is tapped into some of these ideas that we've been talking about. They're very Wilsonian ideas about inherent or implied constitutional powers. And in the foreign affairs arena, I think in the first instance for Wilson, they're powers of the United States. Uh, they're not primarily executive powers, they're government powers, but they are in fact carried into effect by the um, 
by the agent of the United States in foreign affairs, which is principally the president. So I think that's a nutshell uh, account of the kind of view that someone like Wilson um, would have. He wouldn't believe in big gaps or lacuna in American foreign affairs powers under the Constitution. He would think that the United States has those powers implicitly. John? Jonathan? Yeah. Um, so certainly among the many things that James Wilson has a hand in and is responsible for, uh, the American presidency is a big part of it. I mean, he advocates the idea of, of something like a national popular vote. He devises the sort of Byzantine system of presidential electors that follows as sort of secondary option. He's a big believer in popular sovereignty in the space of presidential authority. That This person will sort of, the, his pyramid imagery of how sovereignty works will sort of stand on this broad base of democratic support. And he also wants the president to have a lot of authority. Now, exactly what that authority is on its own terms and then vis-a-vis -vis the other branches is complex because he clearly wants a strong executive branch that will be able to execute and enforce national and federal law in a way that had proved very difficult given the state's intransigence under the articles. Now, the more muscular version of the unitary executive theory to which John spoke that Alexander Hamilton helps begin give voice to in the foreign affairs disputes of the 1790s, I don't think is aligned with how James Wilson saw things. He saw the sort of broad foreign affairs powers as something given to the national government that pretty much all the branches would have a very meaningful say in. I mean, even at one point in the Constitutional Convention, he suggests that the Senate will probably be the depository of most powers concerning foreign affairs. Um, and he certainly thought that Congress and the president would share a lot of that authority. He also thought the judiciary would play an enormous role. There'd be few things the judiciary would do that'd be more important than handling and policing foreign affairs. And this also you know, is, is good, good reminder of their vision of practical separation of powers. Governance was hard. It had proved hard in the 1780s. It was gonna prove hard in the 1790s. Some of the formal distinctions that we think are really important um, we don't see those exercised in the 1790s during the neutrality dispute. The Supreme Court justices go over to George Washington's home and they hash it out together with uh -huh. an understanding being that they play, they're, they're playing this vital role in governance. We would consider that are potentially quite shocking today. Um, but James Wilson, I don't think in this particular space saw some of those sharp distinctions that have since emerged that owed a lot to the debates that came out of the 1790s. And I think that tracks with some of the things that he said, both at the convention and then thereafter in his law lectures and on the bench. Let me pick up quick then that thing. Let me pick up on, on John's mention of Southern, say the Belmont case, where Roosevelt recognizes Stalin's government. And Holland Fisk Stone says, you know, New York has an aversion to simply delivering the ass assets of private persons and corporations to Stalin's government. We have a problem with that. And um, Stalin's position is, well, this is the type of recognizing a foreign government. It goes hand in hand with military strategy. And uh, if it goes wrong, people in New York can't be held responsible. So yes, we have to make that decision and, and private assets are delivered. And then when Jimmy Carter settled the Iranian crisis, there are lots of Americans who have vendors, who have bills to, to uh, Iran. I'd be sweeping them away. This is really an extensive power that overrides, you know, the kinds of laws that would protect people from having their assets seized and given to something like Stalin's government. It, would you say that still, that Wilson must really encompass that in the logic of this scheme? Yes, I do. I, uh, Wilson, unlike so. um, so. many of the founders, denied that the states individually ever had extra, what they called external sovereignty or the, the concept right. of external. So right from the get-go, as the declaration is being written, the articles is being drafted. And you can see in those drafts that it, it's, it's um, a collective enterprise to deprive the states of foreign affairs powers, essentially, and to vest them um, where they ought to be vested, which is in the nation, in the United States, the nascent uh, nation of the United States. And I agree with Jonathan that the, the unitary executive theory is complex here. And Wilson said things that originate the theory. But on the other hand, I agree with Jonathan that um, he's really not perfectly aligned with the way that position is commonly understood. 
because he distinguishes, I think, between executive power and national government power. And he would locate many of the residual or implied executive powers that Unitarians tend to locate in the president, he would locate those in the nation first and foremost. And then there would be a question of who gets to execute that power or carry that power into effect. And we should always bear in mind that Wilson was the person who drafted the necessary and proper clause, which is the clause of the constitution that kind of ties the three departments together and vests in Congress lawmaking authority um, in every case in which those departmental powers and the powers of the government as a whole need to be carried into effect. So any uh, theory of these matters has to sort of account for all of those parts of the constitution. And what one often sees here is that writers are only picking up on one or the other part of the complete design that Wilson and others put uh, put into play. So it's a complicated question, um, but he does believe in strong executive power. I think that's certainly true um, in, in for, for some of the reasons that have been mentioned. Karen, we should probably call this episode one of the John and Jonathan show. We shouldn't stop with this one. We should, we should make this a multi-part series. Um, the, are, there, are there any questions that we could get it? That, get in before uh, before we close? Sure. First is from Charles Barzen, who asks, would juries have been seen by Southerners as protection against common law of crimes as enforced by federal judges? More generally, how important were juries to Wilson's understanding of law and adjudication? Those are... Yeah, well, it's funny because um, I would tell Charles Barzin to read the forthcoming work of Charles Barzin on uh, <laughs> on just this subject. He he too should be included on one of these webinars um, as his interest in Wilson and his jurisprudence and legal science has grown. Um, and I've and he is quite right to draw attention to the importance of juries in Wilson's thinking. Um, it's a complex question that I'm not sure. I mean, I could certainly see it cutting both ways. There'd be a lot of reasons to have. So there's the political question of those who are interested in defending the interests of slavery, what institutions they think are going to be on their side. And they would have good reason to think that if these cases could ultimately would, would be resolved in case in with, with local juries having a say, that that would be enormously important. That would also raise the question of whether the jury in question you know, is an impaneled federal jury, because this becomes a problem in the Alien and Sedition Acts, that part of the reason Madison and Jefferson basically revised their history of the original meaning of the First Amendment. There's a phenomenal article on this by Judd Campbell, who's an extraordinary expositor of natural rights and rights culture at the founding. Jefferson and Madison are forced to rethink how they think about this precisely because the mechanism that they thought would handle seditious libel in a way that was conducive with the people's liberty, juries are now being stacked against them because they're basically being, um, you know, federalists have control of the process. Uh, so they create a jurisdictional argument about, um, about how speech regulation works differently at the federal level than it does at the state level, which is something they had not argued 10 years prior. So that's a good example of confidence in juries turns into a lack of confidence in jury, which changes one's arguments. And I think, you know, what John was speaking to, you know, whatever, whether Southerners' fears were hysterical or not, as historians, as people trying to make sense of the period, you have to recognize that they were very real in terms of motivating their actions. Um, they were very worried about what might happen. They were very quick to game things out. Um, so I think they might have some you know, some people might say we can we can avoid the doomsday scenario that you're suggesting because of these other institutions that could step in. But they were usually very good at saying, yeah, but what happens if this? What happens if this? So I, I think that's an initial answer to it. I'll leave it to John if he wants to speak to the importance of juries to, to Wilson's thinking generally. I'll just add a couple of points. And first is to echo what Jonathan said. I think Charles Barzin is the person we ought to have um, on a webinar speaking on this question because he knows as much as anyone about it. But I would just say that I think it. Uh, my answer to the question is it depends. Um, we have to kind of dig into the facts of how juries were acting in these cases. So 
There's a book by a, a historian named Will Thomas called A Question of Freedom. It looks very closely at all of the freedom suits that were being brought by enslaved people in um, Maryland, right around where I live, in some cases um, against uh, Jesuit slaveholders who are connected with Georgetown University. So that's why I'm aware of the book. And it's a fantastic book. I recommend it to everyone. And that is um, the kind of study that would provide an answer to the question. So we really actually have to see how juries were acting in cases, and there were many of them, in which slavery was coming under um, threat. I will say that my sense is that many of the stronger jury rights and jury protections in the Constitution come from Southerners. Actually, this is not only in the 1787 Constitution, but in Madison's amendments, you sort of see an effort to strengthen jury trial rights. And I do believe it's probably related to the slavery issue to some extent. But on the other hand, Wilson, who was not doing it for that reason, he was a big believer in juries. And this flowed from his Readian common sense epistemology, if you will, his sense that um, uh, ordinary people have uh, the capacity to act as jurors, and it's important. They play an important role in a democratic society um, as jurors, and it flows from his understanding of their capacities. Um, so he's kind of different, I think, from some people on that point. So I think it's an issue that kind of goes in both directions, and it's um, one that we ought to be empirical about as far as gathering up as much information we can uh, at the ground level. Great, we have another question from a, an anonymous attendee asking, given the national character of the general government and the scope of enumerated federal powers, how should we understand interstate commerce in Wilson's view? Hmm. That's a great question. I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll offer some initial remarks I, as I know John has much to say. The first thing I'd point to, which I think is really important, which gets to the significance of Wilson and how he allows us to see a different founding in a different constitution than we might otherwise see, <laughs> is to recognize that for him, the modern obsession, which has been around a long time at this point, with the scope of the commerce power, was not an obsession, precisely because he was not terribly interested in understanding these questions from the framework of limited enumerated powers and how broad are their scope. He was instead drawn to that way of thinking that, that comes out early in 1774 to 1777 that I spoke to earlier. Ask yourself first, is the, th is the particular thing that the government is at being asked to regulate or legislate on general in character or not, continental in character or not? It's something he emphasizes in 1777. It's something he emphasizes in 1785 in his pamphlet defending consider the, the Bank of North America. It's something he emphasizes again and again at the Constitutional Convention. If he indeed is the co-author of Resolution 6 of the Virginia Plan, as John has argued, and I think is, is, is definitely the case, he emphasizes it there. And he definitely emphasizes it in the Pennsylvania Ratifying Convention when he says, this is not going to come down to um, a list of powers on either side, that's impossible to define. It's going to ultimately come down to this question of, of general or not general. Well, fast forward to someone like John Marshall and what he writes in McCulloch, and there's different ways to interpret it. But one standard reading is this is a very different approach. <laughs> Rather than retaining and developing and building upon that general, not general language, here instead is we have a list of enumerated powers. What exactly do each of those, what, what domains of governance do each of those pick out and how broad is the scope? And Marshall works within that framework and latches onto the idea of commerce and does so for good reason because a lot of cases that are actually about interstate commerce are on his docket. <laughs> but then you fast forward decades and decades and decades and people are still talking about it, still in that space, except now they're trying to make sense of things that to a lot of our eyes don't really seem like commerce. <laughs> um, and Wilson never went down that road. He was always of the belief. It's not about two lists. It's not about a list here and a reserve here. It's about this more general question that comes from trying to understand the declaration and the nature of the United States. What in effect are the powers of a general nature? What are not? That's how we figure out federalism or how we should. Controversial at the time, not everyone agrees, but it's something that I think that, you know, so that's the first answer. He had views on commerce, but his first answer would be, why are all of you today so obsessed with commerce? What's, what happened here? This is a peculiar departure from 
what I thought I was doing in 1790. Let me take sneak in this moment to post a quest problem I posed to uh, raised with uh, John and Jonathan last night, but something we can take up maybe later uh, about whether uh, on the Civil Rights Act of 1964, every, everything cast in, in terms of the Commerce Clause. And the Commerce Clause has always represented an implausible mode of reasoning about these things. So the problem is if Black people travel less, we fuel orders for linen and meat and other things. So what is the wrong done to Black people? It's going to diminish the volume of interstate commerce. That's not the ground on which we reach the issue. My question is, I'll post this for later. We'll, we'll make, take this up later. Would Wilson give us some other mode of reasoning about this matter of the federal government reaching into private entities, restaurants, inns, discriminating on the basis of race? We'll, we'll post this for another time. But let's, Garrett, we have other questions in the queue, I think. Right now, the queue is open. Um, I think, well, John, you know, we, have, we probably have 10 more minutes before we have to go. Um, uh, I, I was quite taken when I attended the Federal Society Student uh, Symposium in 2022, uh, and you engaged in a debate with Michael McConnell over uh, the meaning of executive power. And you were drawing, you know, largely on Wilson's role in the um, stages of the drafting um, during the uh, drafting of Article Two um, uh, in his uh, role on the Committee on on Detail. For the benefit of our listeners, could you detail? your precise disagreements with um, Michael McConnell. And by the way, the book that Michael McConnell wrote, though, President Who Would Not Be King, I highly recommend it. It's, it's a wonderful book, um, but it, it's kind of you know, uh, putting in place a framework that um, is uh, serving for, for further debate. And I think that was why you and he had such a fruitful debate that day um, on the stage. Well, well, sure. I, I think Michael McConnell has written a terrific book on uh, the origins of Article Two and, and presidential power. Um, and I blurbed the book. Actually, I said that I thought it was masterful. And I, I, I stand by that. I do think it's incomplete and uh, doesn't you know, get, answer all of the questions. And some interesting challenges have been uh, made uh, against Michael's perspective. Um, one point that I have picked up on recently and I'm starting to write about is that I think the the sort of image that he presents of just how Article Two was drafted by the Committee of Detail might be incomplete in an important way. He's interested in the fact that it seems from the records that we have that the two principal actors in the Committee of Detail, which were Wilson and John Rutledge, were in effect allocating royal prerogative powers between the president and Congress when they drafted the Constitution and the Committee of Detail. And that, that certainly seems to be um, uh, you, you know, what they're doing to some extent. The, the sort of point that I have added is that um, most of, and I'm sort of in some sense channeling what other people have pointed out in this respect, most of those powers had already been vested in the United States by the Articles of Confederation. Um, right. As Andrew Kent who is writing on this topic, uh, puts in a draft, uh, he's writing about McConnell's book. He says, they've been Americanized. I think that's an interesting way to think about it. Um, right from 1776 onward, there had been a transformation of the royal prerogative powers into what I think of were national powers. And it's only from that point uh, that we have to understand what Rutledge and Wilson did. And if you, uh, in the Committee of Detail in 1787, and the reason this becomes important is how we think about things like the so-called royal residuum and whether, for example, in the vesting clause um, of Article 2, Wilson understood when he drafted that clause that he was vesting in the executive or that the Constitution was vesting in the executive all kind of residual royal prerogative powers that weren't expressly enumerated. And I, I think that's a questionable view. Um, I'm drawn to, and Mortensen and others have done, uh, in effect, I think he's arguing a Wilsonian view, which is to say, and Wilson says this early in the convention, strictly speaking, executive powers are fairly limited. It's the power to execute the laws and the appointment power, um, I think Wilson thinks is an executive uh, power, but not necessarily um, additional implied powers. And most Presidential power theorists, and I think Michael McConnell would be one of these, would see more being granted through the vesting clause 
Um, and I'm, I'm unconvinced. I'm not, frankly, um, my mind is not fully made up on this question because I think it's hard and I feel like I'm still learning. Every time I read a, a new article on this, I'm, I, I think my mind shifts a little bit. Um, there are many important and, and excellent presidential power scholars who are writing on you know, just this question right now at a depth and with a, an intensity that I think is probably un, you know, unprecedented. Um, so it's, it's a full-time job to kind of keep up with presidential power scholarship right now. But my short answer to your question is that I think I would probably part company with Michael over things like the scope of the powers conveyed by the vesting clause or the take care clause. Let me just end with a concrete example. The removal power is obviously of great importance in contemporary constitutional litigation and then going all the way back historically to the decision of 1789. I'm uh, more drawn to the idea that the power to remove officers is one of those implied corporate powers Correct. vested in the government of the United States as a whole, rather than a power that was conveyed to the president by the vesting clause or perhaps the take care clause of Article 2. Wow. Because, again, going back to the 18th century law of corporations, any corporation has the power to remove its officers implicitly. And it doesn't have to be spelled out in a corporate charter. You don't have that's one of those things that needn't be enumerated. Um, and if that's the way we think about the government of the United States, then it is a power that the founders assumed existed in the government, but it would be up to Congress to delineate the scope of that power. It might be that in those early acts, those organic acts that created the, you know, the, the great executive departments like war, treasury, and foreign affairs, what the Congress was doing was not affirming a constitutionally vested power in the president, but rather delegating a power to the president implicitly that they could countermand or that they could, you know, put limits on if they so chose. And that's the view that I'm more drawn to. And Michael would see things, I think, quite differently. That's, that's quite persuasive, John. Can I just make a quick, a quick in here now? You think back to Morrison versus Olson, you know, the special counsel, independent counsel, and Rankless was saying, well, the executive just acquiesced in this. This was an adjustment for the political branches. And Scalia's position was he didn't have the authority to acquiesce in that. He right. didn't have the authority to give, him, give the executive powers away. What, what's your own sense of that? I'm not persuaded by Justice Scalia's opinion in Morrison. I'm, I know it's a great opinion rhetorically, and you know it's an important opinion. I teach it um, to my students, and it's worth grappling with. But um, we should remember that he was in dissent <laughs> um, on this point. The, the, most of the justices were seeing things quite differently. And our tradition, I mean, here's where history is important. There is a lot of history um, that occurred before Myers against the United States, where Congress was um, shaping um, removal by statute. And we ought to think about that. I mean, there are important constitutional actors in our history. If you go back to the great legislators of the early 19th century, people like Webster and Calhoun and Clay and so forth, and ask, what did they, they think Congress's powers were with respect to removal versus presidential powers? And they all believed, for necessary and proper clause reasons, that Congress had authority in this regard. Um, it's only a 20th and now 21st century view where we think just it's unproblematic to assume that this is a constitutional power vested in the president by Article 2. That's not, I would say, even the dominant view in American history. Another way to think about it, go back and read Brandeis's dissent in Myers. Um, mm, mm. It's, there's a lot there. Um, and McReynolds, for that matter. It's, I, I, there are a few McReynolds opinions that I like, but he has a <laughs> lot of things to say that yeah. are um, in, that, in that dissent, which you know, are worth taking seriously, as, as is the case with Brandeis's dissent. I find, it, I find that very persuasive, John. You're saying it's a way in which... Congress can engage in the conversation with the executive about establishing the terms on which he's making, leaving, leaving these powers. It's, it would be rather like the measure of prerogative that the executive can take the initiative and the legislature can come back either to sustain this thing or to put in limits about it, something like that. that that's right. I mean, that's a general principle that one could bring to bear on many separation of powers issues, that the president has a certain agency. I think. Wilson probably believed that. Someone like Teddy Roosevelt was so enamored with Wilson because he saw in Wilson 
the kind of endorsement uh -huh. of national power that he believed in. Uh -huh. And Roosevelt would locate that maybe more in the president. But what you just said, Hadley, is exactly right. Even if we think that the president has a lot of initiative and a lot of agency in areas where there is no law restraining him, that still does not imply that Congress does not have the power to come in if they so choose and occupy the field or to shape by law mm. um, you know, what, shall be, what shall be legitimate in this area. So we have tended to tilt, I think recently, pretty far in the direction of, um, of unreviewable presidential authority in some of these areas or, or exclusive presidential authority. And I think probably Wilson's view was that it was a much more shared um, situation where Congress certainly had authority in, the, in its lawmaking function to influence horizontally the other departments. Back to Jonathan for last word, maybe, Garrett? Well, I see that there are a couple of questions that ask specifically about our books, John, and when they might be coming out. Um, oh, I, good. I wish, I wish I could say that it would be coming out sooner than it probably will be it's still um it's still very much a work in progress but hopefully in a in a few years time i'm 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 sorry i can't give a more <laughs> definitive timeline um but it's you know it's the problem with writing a book on this sort of subject is it gets bigger and bigger as you try to trace the echoes and afterlives of some of this wilsonian thinking and some of the other people he was allied with like governor morris and fisher ames so uh, our last question then will will be on precisely the writing process, uh, how both of you as um, authors of, of books about Wilson are finding it challenging to write a book about Wilson and how you're overcoming them. But then um, maybe you can also speak to how that's affecting your deadlines. <laughs> well, I'll just quickly say there's a real important history to how we write the history of the founding, which is archival in nature, whose papers were preserved um, or existed in such fashion that it lends itself to a much deeper form of analysis. Part of the reason why there are more books on James Madison or Thomas Jefferson or Alexander Hamilton, and often more attention paid to them, is because there is more immediately to work with in their papers. Um, James Wilson's papers exist, but they are not in the same state. I mean, John spoke to sort of the miracle by which we even have the law lectures. <laughs> if you start to think, why do we have anything from the 18th century? Why do we have all these Madison letters without which you could not write any serious constitutional study of James Madison? Most of it, yeah, there's the Federalist Papers and other essays. So much of it is based in the correspondence where he deeply laid out his views. Um, you face that challenge with Wilson. You don't have the same body of material. So you end up having to take very seriously some of these other statements he made, not just in the law lectures, but his pamphlet considerations on the Bank of North America, where he defended the Bank of North America, a document I never thought was especially important until John convinced me that few things written in the 1780s were more important um, and deserved to be taken seriously precisely because here Wilson laid out an expansive vision of constitutionalism that gives us a real sense of how he thought. Um, and But that is a challenge that we don't have. You, you, you finish reading Chisholm and then you say, now I want those 12 letters that he wrote to his confidants um, in which he elaborated on his views and heard huh. feedback. If only we had them, but it is a challenge. Yeah, I, I agree with everything Jonathan just said. And I would just add that uh, an additional challenge, because there is no published collected papers of Wilson, um, some of what we have is still in manuscript form and some of it has never been transcribed to this day. Really? Um, wow. And, and so, um, for example, one of the projects that I've been in, engaged is in is to transcribe Wilson's first law notebooks that he wrote in the 1760s when he was uh, uh, an apprentice with John Dickinson. We have th those exist. Um, they're in the uh, Historical Society of Pennsylvania's uh, collection, but they've never been transcribed. And so to work through those, that's what gives you a good window into Wilson's intellectual formation. He's a, such an interesting person. He had a humble beginning in Scotland. He was not uh, a noble from a, from a noble or a high placed or an affluent family. 
but he had a fabulous university education. And then he comes to the United States or to America. It's not the United States yet. And um, you can see it's important to see what Wilson is reading and thinking about when he's 23, 25, 28, 30, right? The period before he bursts onto the national scene and starts to have such a quick and big impact on national politics. And, but to do this, it takes a lot of time. It, it's really uh, painstaking and wow. um, tedious work, frankly. Yeah. And so to write the kind of book on Wilson that I'd like to write, one first has to uh, gather all of that information and to, to transcribe um, documents that have still not to this day been transcribed and then to analyze them and to think about them. Um, uh, so that is, you know, uh, part of what's causing my effort to take some time, but I'm comfortable with that because it's the kind of book that I, you know, like to, like to write about Wilson would be one that would draw from these untapped sources. No, well, I think they've suggested a number of points already for, few, for future sessions on this. Um, we could maybe, maybe we should make this a continuing series. We'll bring Professor Barson in and, and others. Maybe we have one whole session on Wilson on evidence. That itself is, <laughs> is, is, a, is a great chapter, an interesting uh, topic. So uh, I, I could listen to you two all day. And I'm so grateful to you, both of you for doing this with us. Garrett, are you closing it off for us then? Yes, on behalf of all of our co-sponsors and the attendees of our of our webinar, we'd just like to thank um, you know, Jonathan, John, and of course, Hadley. Um, this, was, this was wonderful. We, what we like to call these programs, they're, they're evergreen. Um, this is the kind of wow. program you could, you could really, you could watch at any point. Um, it's just, it's timeless and we have you to thank for that. So we'll make this available on our website uh, and on YouTube as well for anybody who missed it. Um, you can share that with your friends. Uh, we'll, we'll get that up in a day or two. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll be sure um, to uh, make this not just a standalone. Uh, this, this will have to be uh, part one. So thank you again. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much.